seven steps to better accessibility. Now, we could start off and give you the seven best things to do in headings and alt text or whatever, but you know, come at this in a slightly different approach. So the first thing is accessibility is a journey. There are different layers involved you have to consider. You need to start with awareness building. This is not sheep tip. That's really important. And then it's about at that stage, you need to start looking at errors. You need to start fixing them and how do you go about fixing them? And then you need to future proof what you're doing. Because if you are fully accessible, all your courses fully accessible right now, unless you have a future proofing view of things of how you're going to stop these issues coming up again, you're just going to be going in the wrong direction in that journey. It's like going backwards or off down a small um, dead end. You want to keep going forward. So let's have a look at it. It's a journey. One of the key things with accessibility is you are where you are now, and you generally know where you want to go. You want to have it, the, your course content to be accessible for all. Because when there are barriers, and usually barriers are created by decisions, but when there are barriers in place, then some people will not be able to interact or access your content in the way that others can. And just like if you choose not to have subtitles or captions or transcription, then you are choosing that those who may be hard of hearing or maybe are in an environment that is noisy and they can't hear you very well, or maybe who are deaf, will not be able to engage with your content in the same way. So this is the decision you make and you need to be able to consider how you remove that barrier. So that's one step on the journey that you can consider. But it is something that as long as you're improving every day and dealing and tackling these issues progressively, you're going in the right direction on that journey. But when you think about the different things you're going to tackle, you need to consider the different layers involved because it's not just about the content. And if you just made your content perfect and didn't think about the other layers, it's not your content then gets hidden behind them and obfuscated, it gets hidden by the inaccessibility of the other layers. And what do I mean by that? So you're going to have, if we start actually at the bottom with number eight on this list, you have a device, whether they're using a desktop, whether they're using um, a Windows machine or an, or an iPad or an iPhone or an Android phone, that device has innate accessibility, both challenges and options and configurations that can make their life better for the user. And then on top of that, then you have maybe an app or a browser, which you are interacting with the overall course and considering how, the, how can they be dealt with? How can they be configured best? So you need to inform, you need to educate the users and also the people who are creating the content a little bit about this so they can understand, well, you know, browsers, there's functions there to increase the font size. So what does that mean when I create content? That means I shouldn't lock the font size to just one size and let it be changed by the browser or the app or something like that. It's like in, uh, and sometimes those features in that browser or app aren't called accessibility features. If you go onto an iPhone and you're in the browser, you can click up at the top where, or at the bottom now where it has the address. You can increase the font size or decrease it. It doesn't say it's an accessibility thing, but if you're like me and you don't like wearing your reading glasses, it's really handy to do that. But then you have the application framework. And in this case, you're talking about the Moodle or the Blackboard or whatever other LMS you're having. And you need to understand what it does, how it approaches it. Has it been certified? Does it do things to make things better and how it can be configured? So in one of the LMSs I'm helping roll out at the moment, um, we have built in that a student can choose to have different fonts, different font sizes in their profile rather than using a widget. So it's a standard thing for a student that they can customize their experience. That's really key. It's the student understanding that. And then you've got your theme and the branding. Some of your colors might be wonderful. Some of them, they might not work well together. You need to consider that as well. And then you have the site configuration, navigation, and then the course structure and the content, and maybe even other student content. So ensuring that a student, when they add an image, also add a description in a forum. That's really important too. So you've got all of these different layers and you need to have a plan for how you're gonna address each of them, even if it's not necessarily your responsibility. And these are the kind of content areas that are there. You might have naming, structure, HTML, so um, content building web, you might have files, 
settings and features. So that's all those layers. And ideally, you want your course to be designed to be accessible by default to the widest possible audience. So actively not adding barriers. So let's move to the next level. It's about building awareness. You, if you're going to build a house, if you're going to build a building, you're going to build infrastructure, you're going to start off with the foundations. And one of the really good, oops. Um, so one of the challenges with that is that staff aren't subject, they're subject matter experts. They're not accessibility experts, and they're not intentionally ignorant of accessibility requirements. It maybe just hasn't been put up there to the same level as spell checking, which ironically in Word nowadays, spell check and check accessibility within Word are like an inch apart on the interface. So one of the really good scaffolding um, approaches is taken by Sculpt. This is done by Worcestershire um, County Council. It's really good. Some very simple basic accessibility things, which apply to everything, because these apply to email just as much as they do to web content. And then on top of that, you might use what, like what the UK Home Office does, where they have a set of posters around the do's and don'ts for designing for users with specific accessibility needs, autism, blindness, no vision, and so on. And these go through very clear do's and don'ts of what to do. But you're building on that early layer you're sort of building up that house and structure to be a solid foundation. But then ongoing, and this is one of the key things, it's so important. You know, often I have seen people get their LMS training in September, and then they might get a top up next September. And not always the same people come back, but most often. So a lot of them don't. And so what we're talking about is sheep dip training. Oh, sorry, not sheep dip whiskey, which is really good, by the way. But I'm talking about sheep dip training, where basically you're bringing your staff in, dipping them and hoping that knowledge sticks to them for the whole coming year. And that's something which just doesn't work. So earlier on, they were talking about continuing professional development. Oh, yeah, sheep doesn't like that idea at all. However, it is about scheduling this so that, for example, yes, in September, they do their base training. But then in October, you're going to go, OK, well, this is going to be image awareness month. And you're gonna highlight all the key important aspects of how you use images, color contrast in them, writing on them, the descriptions, how and when to do it. And then maybe in November, you're going to look at links, how to make better links, how to make links more accessible to everybody. If you're looking at a page and all of the links say read more, that's not helpful to anyone. It's really unhelpful to the screen reader who basically will go link read more, link, read more. You want to know where the link is going. And then in December, you might do another one. And throughout the year, you're having this constant building on that scaffolding to improve the accessibility understanding of staff. And also, so it's not just raised in September and left. It's a constant, you know, this is as important as spell checking. You know, you won't share something without spell checking. They always slip through, but in general, you should be doing accessibility at the same level. So we've got our journey. We understand that it, it has multiple layers and so on. But now, what about for the future? Okay. And, and dealing with the stuff. So the first thing is, so we, we have an approach how we work, which is fine, fix, and future proof. And that has Moodle there, but it can apply to your own LMS as well, the concept. So the first one is find. And what does that mean? Well, it means and the analysis of the content built inside your LMS. Word has an accessibility checker, doesn't do everything, but so if you're using Word and Office, that has there. Google Docs, you can pay for Grackle, which is an institutional level subscription to do accessibility checking inside Google, Google Docs. But you wanna check against those standards and you wanna look at the results across the site to understand what is the challenge you have ahead. But then on top of that, you want to look at it in a course and let a teacher get, choose to get insights into what issues they're creating and what barriers they're putting in place for their students. And then you want to slice it up to see what those big issues are and where are the recurring issues. So is it always, I mean, everyone usually has habits. Some people always create a link and open in a new window. They shouldn't, but if they don't know why, they're going to keep doing it and they'll probably have lots and lots of those across there or if they're always just pasting in a link without putting a proper name on it, they're gonna have lots of those. So they're gonna be recurring themes for, pe for certain individuals or even schools and departments, depending how they operate. 
And in this, this is just, a, for example, a graph of an activity pass rate where the orange is the fails, the purple is the past, and in the middle there, you've got labels, which in Moodle, often people put loads of HTML stuff in there, lots of images, some are decorative, most aren't. I remember in one, in one particular course, there were like 20 images in there, they were all ticked as decorative and not one of them were. You needed the information on the image, but yet it was hidden from people who couldn't see the image. So you know what your issues are, you've got your priorities, you need to fix them. So what are the fixing options? Just, and, and, and this is key, there's gonna be manual fixing of some of the issues. Some of them you're gonna to have to go back in. If you've uploaded a PDF in there, you know, you're gonna need to find the original Word document or PowerPoint and fix it in there. And that's where Microsoft have awesome training materials around creating more accessible tools there. And then you can export it out to a PDF if you want, or just link it from Office 365 inside of your Moodle. But then you're also gonna have some automated tools to either mitigate or fix some of the issues. Now you have to be careful about how, how they are done. Some of those widgets, which you can just drop in and pay subscriptions for, and they just have these things that a student can choose to manipulate. You know, there's some really good stuff online about why you shouldn't use those widgets, but we're not gonna get into that right now in any more detail. But then you've got interfaces to triage and bulk fix. You want to make it easier. There's no point telling a teacher, you've got 5,000 issues with your course without going, but hey, we're gonna help you solve 80% of them. And then future proof, future, this is absolutely key. You're fully accessible now. You want to keep going in the right direction. You need to make sure you have a better editor controls and process, how you create content, how teachers create content, how to create those Word documents. You're gonna have, um, oops, you wanna have alternate options. If something is accessible, but technically difficult, you need to have an alternate option. You wanna have performance support, constantly build on those foundations and you also want to have things like automated content conversion for student needs. Like they can choose an audio file and they can choose to have it fast or slow, depending on their own particular needs. So quick recap, it's a journey. Um, there's different layers involved. You need to consider them and understand them. You need to start with that awareness building, continuing skill development, skill, something that happens over time. It isn't a sheep dip training. Find those errors, fix and triage them, and future-proof the platform and the process. So, if I have any time left. <laughs> you just won one, one minute ago. <laughs> one minute, okay. Go for it, people. <laughs> so, if anybody's any questions, you can come in either in um, audio or text, whichever you want. All quiet. And okay. hopefully people found the transcript stuff useful. But yeah, no, it was very useful, Gavin. Thanks for that. Um, can I ask if any of this work has been published anywhere in a neat package that we can look up? I do have some of that sort of stuff. I'll share links in around some around some of this. One of the things we do have a product that does helps with some of that in Moodle, but the philosophy can be done anywhere, you know. And there's a huge amount about sheep dip training, for example, why it's really bad. This is just an example, you know. It's um if you suddenly have to learn lots of rules around accessibility, learn it in September, will you still be able to remember it in May? Unlikely. <laughs> we have a couple of questions in there, Gavin. Thank you um, there. Um, is it challenging to get staff to buy into accessibility? So it can, it really depends how it's pitched. I mean, one, it's about inclusion. It's about making it usable by everybody. But sometimes it has to be top down if the, the bottom up approach doesn't work. You know, it needs to be, there needs to be institutional buy-in that this is important, not just staff buy-in. It needs to be up there as this is important. And COVID has shoved digital access right up there. Um, I mean, it was unprecedented to go back to the, the keynote, unprecedented for some, but some have been doing this for years. You know, it wasn't unprecedented at all for them. And I think that's one of the key things. So yeah, with staff, get them to choose to be involved, you know, and eventually students will push them. Yeah, that's very true. An awful lot of the training students, once they hear about it, they ask for things and it does bring the staff on a lot more. I found that in my own practice. Um, Monica's wondering there, has any place nailed how to do the continual training? Uh, well, um, 
it's 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 key you know um i think one of the things i really like that um i'm not sure he's on here the moodle munch series for example in ran out of dcu is really good it's regular webinars um but having that thematic month or every week or every two weeks with something is really good but have them regular have them recorded have them short people want to be able to go in and get what they need to know for that month in 10 15 minutes they don't want to be wading through hours of stuff so 